Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Yael and I'm a Senior Leadership Executive for School Operation and Facility Management at ISS. This is the first webinar in a series of webinars on school operations, um, which we will be broadcasting in the coming weeks. We plan these webinars to enhance the ability of school leaders and school operation staff to navigate their efforts efficiently and effectively during these uh, unprecedented times and to be prepared as much as possible uh, for the unknown future. We would love to hear from you what are your most pressing issues so we can uh, tailor the webinars uh, to, the best, to, to best assist you in the near future and beyond. Please share your ideas and requests in the chat area to the right of the video window. So let's start with some practicalities. Um, please keep your microphones muted. We encourage you, as I said before, to share resources and ideas on, in the chat area. Um, the link for this webinar will be sent to participants and posted on the ISS website and YouTube, along with the transcript for the, uh, of the chat later today. There are several, uh, several people from ISS working on this webinar, and I would like to introduce them to you. Dana will help me facilitate the conversation. Say hi, Dana. Hello. John is our tech guy guru. He is behind the scenes and making sure everything runs smoothly. And uh, Steve, say hi, Steve. Um, he will be navigating the questions you will be posting during the webinar. So uh, on um, part one of the webinar, we will address the questions that you were submitted ahead of time, which uh, were chosen after we sorted out the, the questions by subjects and picked a few of them, uh, a few from each subject. Um, towards the end of this uh, session, Bill Person, say hi, Bill, will guide you through a very helpful tool uh, that he developed for, uh, for budget scenarios. Uh, the spreadsheet uh, that he will share will be also available for you on the ISS website later. On part two, Steve will lead the discussion in effort to answer some of the questions you uh, will be posting during the webinar. So now I will ask the uh, panelists to introduce themselves with uh, Kevin, I think, starting first. Um, and uh, I will hand the magic wand webinar wand to Dana. Enjoy. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Bill Pearson. I'm currently the assistant superintendent at uh, the American School in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. I've also been an assistant superintendent in the International School of Beijing and also many years at Singapore American School in Singapore. I've also been fortunate to be head of the school in Osaka, Japan and um, Curitiba, Brazil for many years. So I have a mix between head of school and assistant superintendent for business and operations. Thank you. Wonderful, and Leah? Hi, I'm Leah and uh, welcome to everyone to this webinar. I've uh, worked at ICS, the International Community School in Addis Ababa for eight years. It's been a great time for me with my kids. Uh, um, I also worked at Ethiopian Airlines for uh, 13 years, and I'm happy um, to join this webinar and uh, be able to contribute and also learn from all your experiences and questions and hope to be of use to all of you. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome. And Kevin. Thanks, Donna. Um, Kevin Elliott here, originally from Stratford-upon-Avon in England. Um, I was a teacher before uh, moving into the business management side of things. Um, most recently, I was a NYP drama teacher before I moved into uh, business and finance. So uh, that prepared me well for the role. I was the director of finance and business at Canadian Academy in Kobe for five years. Um, some of the challenges I had there were really uh, learning the role, of course, and then restructuring with the post layman shock, which, which hit Japan pretty hard. Um, as well as master facilities planning, which is a little bit easier than the layman shock. Um, I had five years in, in Kobe before moving to the British school in Tokyo. Um, fascinating change from Kobe, still in the same country, obviously, still in Japan, um, but in many ways polar opposites from Kobe. 
Um, Tokyo is fast paced, high growth, and uh, really interesting school to be in. There I was in charge of building projects and planning for campus relocation. Uh, and I'm now speaking to you from Beijing. I'm the Director of Business Administration at Dulwich College Beijing, obviously part of the global Dulwich network. We have 1,500 students, long waiting lists and excellent academic results. So I've been teaching in many schools around the world, but leading in three, in three very different uh, schools and different contexts. Um, of course, during my time as an international educator, I've seen uh, the SARS disaster as a teacher. Um, in 2013, we had the terrible earthquake and tsunami, and now we have the COVID-19. So all very challenging events, uh, lots of learning that took place. And I'm really happy to be here with you all to share what knowledge I have. Wonderful. And Chris? Hi, my name is Chris Evans. I am the Chief Finance and Administration Officer at International School Services. I've um, been working with them for about seven and a half years now, working with um, international schools. And prior to that, I worked at Outward Bound. So I've been in the nonprofit arena for quite a few years. Um, I was a, I am actually a former Peace Corps volunteer and lived in Uruguay. I saw someone from Punta del Este jump on, so I want to say hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> and prior to that, I was in the public accounting area. Um, so I've had lots of experience with finance, budgeting, forecasting, um, and navigating some difficult financial situations in some of my jobs. So I'm glad to be here and welcome everyone. Welcome. And Glenn. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone. My name is Glenn Oldland. I am a former head of school coming to you from Grand Bend, Ontario. I have worked in schools in Canada and Singapore and India. And having repatriated back to Canada in 2017 to be closer to our now five grandchildren, I now have two part-time roles. One is as an adjunct professor at Western University in London, Ontario, where I'm the academic program manager for an IB educator certificate program that we are poised to launch in the next few weeks. And I'm also a senior leadership executive with, um, with ISS, working with uh, the Dalian American International School in Dalian, China. Wonderful. All right, um, I'm gonna start in with our very first question. Um, the first question is, given the extremely high fixed costs for a school year, once staff have been contracted and other year long expenses are confirmed, accreditation, insurance, rental, all those things. How can we build flexibility into the annual budgeting process so that we can adjust to change if it comes again next year? Uh, Kevin, would you like to start us off with that question? Sure. Okay. Um, well, when we think about international schools as a business model, model we're, we're kind of like oil tankers in that um, we do have high fixed costs. And um, if we're lucky enough, we fixed our budget in February, most likely in May or June, but we try and fix it early and then that's it. And we're stuck to that plan and the budget is set type of thing. But school finance is relatively simple. Um, you know, once we've set the student numbers and we've aligned the teacher num teaching numbers, we've added in a few extra costs along the way for education, then we can set our tuition and maybe build in a little buffer to allow for our long-term planning and growth and, and protection. And, and that's it. Perfect. School finances is set. Of course, the problem arises uh, when we have to become speedy, nimble uh, speedboats and try and navigate situations like we're in at the moment. It's just not possible to change fast enough. We've had our budget set, we've got our teachers recru recruited, we've got our students signed up hopefully, and there just aren't enough easy cost cuts to make. Um, if you've budgeted well, you know, you've got a little margin there, so you haven't outpriced yourself for the market, you haven't played into the competitors' hands, and of course you haven't upset parents. Um, over the years I've been doing this, I've been to countless town, talk, town hall meetings uh, when, we set budget, when we set tuition. And of course the parent question is always, when I was in a non-profit situation, the question was always, why do we make a surplus? Why do we make a profit from the parent side? From our side, why do we make a surplus? Um, the surplus of course is there as our insurance policy. It's there to counter what might happen. 
and of course that is where we are now so when it first hit here in when covid first hit here in uh, beijing of course i went through all the immediate things that i could do negotiating buildings maintenance stuff reducing guards cancelling busing cancelling bus monitors taking care of cleaning food service um, of course pd is an easy and understandable one to press pause on uh, we looked at all areas of where we could save money um, but there just is no magic bullet and if there were we probably have all used it by now so if thinking beyond facilities at the school um, people are really our, our biggest thing that's students teachers and parents and communicating early and often with these important stakeholders is really important early often and transparent um, the relative successes that we've had here at Dulwich College Beijing have all been around having a strong team in place uh, recognizing their importance and really communicating with them I think most international schools are obviously going to suffer in the third and the fourth quarter this year I think unfortunately that's inevitable um, it's just going to happen but how well we look after our people uh, from this time on that's going to de deter how quickly we can all recover from this so I suppose in short the short answer is we have to plan for emergency situations like this we have to build in that flexibility years and years in advance we're going to have to draw on our reserves to get through this situation of course we can look to bring in new revenue we can look to a bigger a better summer school if we're allowed to open during summer all of these types of things so my answer is really you've got to be looking in the past have you been building your reserves long enough for this i hope that's helpful it's very helpful and i really appreciate the fact that you um, reminded everyone that it's also about the people and taking care of our students and our families that's just so 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 important in today's with today's environment um i'd like to turn us into question number two um and chris this is um directed towards you um but how can we prepare an adequate financial policy to help our parents who can't pay for a kid's school expenses because of all of this what do we do uh thanks dana yeah so thinking about this question I mean, it, as everyone knows, the situation is currently evolving and every day seems to bring a new set of challenges that we need to think about. So all we can do is keep looking and um, trying to make decisions based on the information that we have available because the answer for one school may not be the correct answer for another. As Kevin just discussed with the amount of fixed costs that a school carries, it's not as simple as not increasing tuition or offering rebates. And yes, if your school does have a, a reserve, you can um, use that to help offset, but not all these schools have the reserves um, or the ability to do that. So at ISS, when we've been working with our schools, um, First and foremost, we've looked to the school's mission, their culture, and their principles when thinking along the right way to help guide the financial policy with our parents. Um, some of the things that we take into consideration are being, number one, as transparent as possible to parents and families um, on the plans for the school, to educate them on the remote teaching that's happening, ask for feedback as to how it's working for them, and explain you know, how reliant the program is on the revenue, the only revenue stream, generally speaking, uh, the tuition. Uh, I think communication is, is key, and just making sure that you're communicating with the families to let them know that you're, you're thinking of them and thinking of ways to help them, as well as keeping the school solvent, because that's the number one, well, one of the priorities is keeping the school so that it's there for future years to help students learn. Um, I would suggest evaluating how the school's online learning is progressing so that you can talk to the parents to that. Um, just because the physical facilities are closed doesn't mean that the students aren't receiving excellent learning um, and they're still what they're getting what they're paying for. Uh, consider potentially 
that there may be certain groups in your school that aren't reaping as much benefits from online learning, like early childhood, for instance, I know is much more difficult. So maybe you can focus your possible rebates, credit efforts towards those groups, for instance. Um, because definitely the faculty at the school is working even harder now than they have been in the past. Um, remote learning, I know because I have children doing remote learning in New Jersey and it's just very difficult. Um, so some of the other things we've been talking about and, and counseling on are maybe think about different types of payment plans for families to possibly extend time for them to pay. That might help some people. Um, evaluate how long you've been doing remote learning. I mean, China started back in January and some schools are just closing about a month ago. So does that make any difference when you're thinking about how much, if any, rebates or credits to, to offer? Um, each school is different. You have to evaluate if your school can afford to freeze tuition next year. And even if you want to set that precedent of not increasing tuition. Um, and if you don't want to freeze, can you offer, for instance, a, a credit to return families next year to offset those tuition increases as a thank you for being loyal and coming back, that type of thing. Um, always reviewing your next year's budget because this is a, is a multi-year issue. Um, you may have to postpone some expenses, if at all possible, um, to offset any kind of tuition help you can give to your, to your families. Um, think of different ways. Maybe you could help multi-children families. Can you afford to give more of a sibling discount, for instance? Um, uh, can you, as an alternative to paying cash, if, you don't, if you're not cash positive, is your school able to offer maybe summer schools an alternative to offering credits and rebates? Um, Another idea we've been exploring is once school facilities have, um, can have the students return, can you think about offering an online learning only a possibility to add a lower tuition price to families who can't afford the full tuition because of economic issues? Um, you have to think that through though, because you don't wanna make that become more attractive than the full tuition learning. Obviously, you don't wanna move too many students that way. Um, it, but it is important to think about how to emerge from this disruption stronger than you were before and to look ahead and prepare for the possibility of multi-year issues, um, planning for future staffing. You may need to cut back on programs and curriculum to offset any downturn in enrollment. Uh, you may not be able to replace some staff that leaves or you may not be able to renew contracts that expire, for instance. Um, again, it's going to be different in each one, but those are some of the things that we've been thinking about with our schools here at ISS. So I hope some of that was helpful for people. Fantastic. Thank you. You gave me like a million options that um, I hadn't even thought of. So I appreciate that. Yeah, did you want to take it from here? Question number four, should, should we refund some parts of, uh, of uh, fees due to online learning and a lesser learning experience? Kevin, would you? Okay, yeah, big question. Um, <clears throat> so now we're in the situation where online learning is the new reality for so many schools around the globe. Uh, domestic and state-run schools are, are rushing to their new online platform in the same way as international schools. Of course, they don't have to pay refunds um, or are not being asked pay refunds so but basically nobody is immune to this this question um, the way we've approached it is again around having a strong community behind you um, communicating often with our students our parents and the teachers and just trying to mitigate the need for a refund um, it's going to of course it's going to depend on your school's context um, how prepared your student body is uh, how prepared the school is and teachers and then of course, how receptive are your parents? Um, and that will also be linked to factors beyond your control. How, how much are your parents suffering outside of schooling? I mean, we are all suffering from, all, from home homeschooling. I have three children, we are all suffering. Um, but if parents are also Sorry. suffering stresses and strain. But if parents are also suffering stresses and strain. But if parents are also Maybe Leah, if you could mute. Thank you. I think that will work. Sorry, I was talking about pain, <laughs> homeschooling. So um, yeah, the other thing is how, how much are your parents suffering outside of the schooling environment? They may, many of our parents have their own businesses. 
um, or are working for companies that are going through a difficult time. It also comes down to how transient your parent body is. You know, will they stay in the country? Uh, if they stay in the country, will they stay with you? Will they move on? Just everybody's situation is so very different. Um, also, for our own contents here in, in Beijing, the country may, may have told us that you can or you can't give refunds. Um, there may be very rigid. There certainly are very rigid times that we can and can't open up here. We've been on online learning for 13 weeks now, and we have our year 13s, which would be US grade 12s back. But that's it. That's all we're allowed. So all of those types of things have to be taken into consideration. Um, and of course, when you are allowed to return to school, can you offer some sort of school enrichment for grade levels or perhaps weekend school to, to make up for the perceived time lost? Um, or are you allowed to extend the school year into summer break, et cetera, et cetera? There's, there's so many different things you could think about. Um, before, all of, so all of these factors that you could think about before entertaining the idea of a refund. And of course, you also have to look at your competitors. What are people doing in your local environment? Um, here in Dulwich College, we've, we've completed numerous surveys, pulse surveys on the students and the parents. Uh, try to take their feedback in and, and shape the various stages of, of online learning. We went into this um, in the third week of January. So we've been getting quite good at it. And it's changed and changed and morphed and morphed more live lessons, more, um, and now we're going to the stage where it's less screen time. So the teacher will introduce something and then hopefully go on to a, a paper-based exercise or an off-screen time. Um, but certainly our teachers have put in a lot of extra effort uh, and working much harder than, than they would in a, con a, a regular school environment. Um, all of the work going on, of course, is to maintain the very best online learning experience that we can. Um, but ultimately, as I said before, any refunds that your school or your district or your group may decide will come from the reserves that you may have been able to build up. Um, or if you don't have reserves, there are going to be some very difficult and challenging questions that I think we'll get to in, in future questions on the panel. Um, yeah, it's all going to be down to a lot about the, the context that your school and your parent body is, is, is set in, I think. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a challenging question, uh, definitely, whether to refund or, or not, because you're working hard, obviously, and, and not doing less than what you would do in the classroom, but still, people yeah. perceive it as, as less, less I mean, of experience, the, I would yeah, say. The ironic thing is, we're working harder. We're the yeah, swarm. Yeah. We're working harder yeah. underneath the water. To keep things going above the water but the, the parents are also working harder to to maintain homeschooling it's tough yeah. it's really so there's a there's a second um, part to this question and uh, leah um i'll refer that to you so we'll try again and and then if it works we'll go back to the to, to the previous question can can school claim force majeure under these circ these uh, extreme circumstances of school closure caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes. Uh, force major is claimed when there is a condition where one of the parties in a contract are not able to perform the services agreed due to conditions beyond their control. Uh, while the mere existence of the virus could not constitute a force major, event, there is no doubt that the WHO pandemic and the binding administrative decisions taken by governments uh, to implement close down of schools prove to the school administrators that the situation they're in is really a force majeure. This is a situation where schools are not able to fulfill their obligations, not due to their own failure, but due to third party measures that don't allow them to make it or make it impossible for them to administer school services as contracted to parents. Uh, thus, schools can claim force measure and not reimburse tuition fees in whole or in part. If schools feel they would like to consider tuition reduction, then an option would be to ensure that the reduction does not go beyond their fixed expenses, payroll, uh, and stuff like that, so that uh, they don't go beyond their actual expenses. I hope that's, that was clear. 
Ja. You're muted, yeah. Sorry about that. How do we, uh, we go back to the previous question, Leah. Uh, how do we manage staffing in a, a time when our enrollment could be down 20% or more? Uh, what are creative ways we can keep everyone employed? The key is with the leadership, the way they handle matters. Uh, is very important uh, in order to be uh, to come out stronger at this time. Uh, by uh, leadership, I mean compassionate leadership. Uh, the leaders, if they show compassion to the employees, half of the problem will be done. Uh, but there are different actions they can take in order to uh, survive this situation. As uh, Kevin said, uh, most schools have, I think, already gone through their uh, different ways of reducing costs and so forth. But um, when it comes to employees, it's very hard to tell them uh, that their employment is going to be terminated. And if there is a possibility of finding ways to solve that, uh, some of the suggestions that I'd like to make is whatever they do, have an open discussion with the employees. Uh, open discussion around what does the crisis look like? How has it affected our schools? Um, how is it that we can deal with it? Because unless we listen to the, uh, their emotions, it will be hard to work uh, out this problem. We need their commitment. We need them to be on our side. So having a transparent and clear communication is very essential. I really appreciate what uh, uh, Jean Clan, author of the book Crisis uh, Leadership said. He said, information is the oil that greases an organization and keeps it running smoothly. So if really uh, we want to solve this problem, uh, communication uh, is very, very important. Another thing that the leadership can do is send a unifying message. The unifying message would be, uh, telling them or showing them that the purpose of the leadership is to keep everyone employed. However, in order to come over uh, or get over this crisis successfully, uh, there is a need to take certain actions like uh, reducing work hours, having a flexible time, uh, allowing more uh, leaves uh, without pay, of course, or sick leaves to take care of their families, or uh, sick uh, families. And also um, we uh, might look at some of the suggestions that Kevin said that could be done. Other ways would be first to ask for volunteers because from my experience with uh, some uh, companies in recent uh, months, uh, what they did was ask volunteers. There might be some who would be uh, able to go for a, an extended leave without pay they're ready to do that and they want to leave the stage for others who can't afford to go without pay. Um, or there might be those who would uh, really uh, like to take on lower uh, level jobs and then have uh, pay cuts uh, just for a temporary period. Or if we have other jobs that have not been done, uh, like you know, we know in our organizations there are so many policies and procedures that have not been written down. And so we can uh, assign some of the staff who are not able to teach or who don't have uh, assignments or who are non-essential. We can give them such kind of jobs that will keep them on the payroll and uh, they can work from home, uh, which will help us to save from transportation, fuel uh, expenses for them and cut down on some benefits like that. Uh, but most of all, leadership has to demonstrate what their contribution is. Um, maybe the uh, leadership can uh, have, uh, uh, you know, personal uh, pay cuts and show to the school that what is it that they have done in order to contribute for this crisis or allow uh, some of the capital uh, expenses that have not been done, you know, they can use those savings and the leadership can quickly take action, can quickly approve without delay so that uh, salaries can be paid. Uh, so really the leadership is very uh, responsible in this aspect to communicate, to take action, to show their own 
uh, initiative from their personal savings. Um, also, they can cut down on, I think Kevin also mentioned it, uh, on outsourced services, substitute hiring, part-time workers, um, and also if there's a possibility of uh, having fundraising initiatives or, um, you know, taking action on uh, certain staff who need to uh, be uh, terminated due to disciplinary uh, uh, situations because this is not a time for us to be uh, very caring, accommodating. We can take action at this time so that we can save those staff that are very critical for our company. Um, so another item I'd like to mention because it was one of the questions uh, that were brought up earlier, for example, quarantine. Uh, if our teachers are required to uh, self-quarantine for two weeks and what is the school going to do? Is it going to pay them salary or not? Maybe we can share, negotiate expenses. Maybe we can, um, you know, tell them that we can afford to pay for their accommodation, pay for their uh, meal expenses, but ask them to forego their uh, salaries for those two weeks. So it's a matter of talking to them, negotiating, uh, and showing them your contribution and uh, just being honest and transparent. And uh, these are the things I'd like to share with everyone. Maybe it was too long, I don't know. No, it wasn't. Thank you very much. Maybe something else that uh, that came to mind while you were speaking was that uh, um, come to to everyone and ask for a, an agreement that everybody will reduce hours uh, and or cut their salaries as instead of uh, firing some of the people. So there will be kind of a, an agreement. I know it's a it's a very romantic kind of a suggestion, but it it can happen if, if uh, you know, if the leadership is, is uh, communicating well and, and people are willing to keep their job, keep everybody's job and, and, and just cut a little bit of their uh, wages uh, and their salaries. So um, Dana, would you, um, thank you, Leah. Sure. Um, you will be Okay, our next question is, uh, what lessons can be brought forward from previous large-scale financial uh, crises? Uh, Glenn, I'm going to turn that over to you because I think you have a huge amount of experience with this. Yeah, thanks, Dana. And uh, I do believe there are lessons that we can learn from previous crises. Each one has its own signature, of course, but um, I'd like to reach back to the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And just to set the context for the, the, the lesson I'd like to tease out of it. Um, I had joined the Canadian International School in Singapore in the summer of 2006, um, coming in as their head of school. We were a, a mid-sized school, but growing quite rapidly, 1,200 on its way to uh, eventually 3,000 students with a very ambitious building plan. We had just um, acquired a third campus and we're in the position, um, or poised to acquire a fourth. And we had a, a, a land, a site that we were going to develop to consolidate three of these four campuses. So we broke ground in 2007, and because of the size of the project, we were still working on the piling works in 2008 when the crisis hit, the, the financial collapse, the global financial collapse. Um, as a result of that, uh, the bank that we were financing the project through came to us and said, uh, you know that 70% financing? Well, it's now 30%. So we were uh, forced to uh, put a hold on our building project and um, ultimately took about 18 months before we could resume that building project, which uh, now in retrospect, you know, we, we understand why and um, aren't surprised by that fact. But over the course of that time, we we've really we faced an existential crisis as a school because we had allowed ourselves to be locked into a transition timeline, in particular on one of our campuses, that had a hard stop to our lease agreement and that we had to move out of that campus in June of 2010. And as the negotiations, the way we um, came out of this crisis really was that we negotiated a joint ventureship, a joint venture partnership with a big um, private equity investment firm and that's what provided the capital for us to be able to build the project, ultimately led to the sale of the school. But all of that to say that we, we almost went under because we didn't anticipate it was going to take so long for us to be able to resume, get the project finished, and, and have a home for one of our communities. And as we were moving through that, we had such anxiety on the part of our parents because we didn't know exactly where that middle school community was going to go that by January of that year, 
families who were very loyal to us, who loved us as a school, were looking for other options because they just couldn't deal with the uncertainty. So in the uh, you know, hindsight of, uh, of uh, in the wisdom of hindsight, being able to look back on that, what I think we could have done more effectively is engage in a much more robust scenario planning process, whereby when the days and weeks after we had to pause our construction, if we had looked at a number of different scenarios, drawn out some timelines and said, what if? What if it takes us two years to be able to be finished? What if uh, we lose a number of the next number of our um, uh, community? Those uh, scenarios would have equipped us to, to at least be attuned to some possibilities and to be taking steps towards mitigating them. I don't think we would have found ourselves in quite the same scenario where we were so late in trying to find a home for one of our campuses. And the concept of scenario planning isn't new, and you'll hear more about that in one of the, the uh, subsequent questions. But uh, the case I'm making is for a, a very robust, um, thoughtful, and um, I guess comprehensive scenario planning process with a senior leadership group. Much of what we've been talking about has a great level of transparency to it, engages uh, all the members of the community, and I believe that's very important. What I'm describing can be a bit alarmist, and it can be very um, sort of frightening. So that's, that's really done at the senior leadership uh, level. And there are two reasons why I believe it's so important. Um, one may be that you have um, forecast a scenario that actually un unfolds, and you have a plan that's at least started to be shaped, if not fully fleshed out and ready to go, and you have, you're prepared for it. That often isn't the case, and your scenario planning sometimes, you know, it misses the actual mark, but the reason it wasn't wasted time is because you have honed a set of skills as a leadership team. You'll be much more quick at being able to collect and analyze data. You will be much uh, more adept at being able to come up with possible solutions. You will have a much greater level of confidence in the merits of those solutions. That, that confidence will be projected. So scenario planning is never wasted time. It always gives you a greater level of confidence in being able to face the unknown, which is what we're all doing. And so I realize it takes time and you have to carve off that time, but to the extent that you can, um, do engage in, in some scenario planning. I will um, post on the, um, we'll have a site where we're posting resources and I've pulled off a few online resources, a, a set of links um, to some models for scenario planning if you haven't done this before. But let me um, urge you to take the time to just theorize about what might happen in your unknown futures and you'll be better equipped to deal with them. Your resources have been great and I posted them in the chat, but for anyone who it, it's sometimes hard to pull the resources off the chat, we'll be sharing them all with you afterwards as well. But scenario planning is just so essential. Um, and um, one lesson I know that I've learned from all of this as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn us to um, question number six. And Bill, this is directed um, towards you. Um, from your point of view, what is the way to decide in which area, like where do we cut the budget? Um, how do we know where to cut, what to cut? And I think you've got some experience with that. Would you mind sharing with us? Sure. Thank you. Um, nice, to, nice to have everybody on board on, in this webinar. Um, where, what areas to cut? A, a lot of these cr um, questions um, tend to overlap. So some of the things that Leah said are some of the same things that I'm going to say. Um, obviously, we have, we're a people business, so we're trying to protect our, our teachers and our administrators as much as possible and balance that with the needs of the, of the students and the parents for paying school fees. Um, I'm going to basically go over four points. The obvious ones are that are that 70 to 85 percent of our of our total budget probably goes to salaries and benefits. That's a given. We all know that. Uh, then the other part is the fixed uh, costs like electricity, utilities, um, that's um, that type of a, a cost, which I call NERT, non employee related costs. Um, when you really get down to discretionary spending, in my view, from my experience, usually it's only about seven to ten percent of your total budget that you have a whole lot of room to cut unless you get into salaries and benefits. That's where the meat is. So where do we make some of these cuts? Um, I think we need to have an approach uh, as you're planning ahead for the next few months and on into next uh, fiscal year. I think you need to have some uh, a logic approach with some target dates. 
Um, our tar target date was the, it was the end of June. Now it's the end of July because in Bangladesh, the prime minister has indicated that um, education institutions will probably not start up until September. Our school was supposed to start in August. So this actually gives us a little bit of relief in that we have time to um, deal with this, this whole pandemic and our planning gives us more planning. So that's good for us. Um, so our number one priority is our effort to try to save jobs. Um, I think it's important that you, that you every couple of days, you look at your enrollment projections, you look what, um, you, you determine whether your current students are re-enrolling, you have them written down, are they actually gonna come back, uh, even if you're virtual? Um, you look at your projected new students, this is one area we are um, way under what our, we were hoping for about 100 new students, right, new, right now we're about 25 to 30. Uh, what other areas can you cut? You can look at your staff, staffing and class sizes. Um, how big are your classes? Uh, have they been pretty small? Can you combine some classes? Is it possible to do a split class um, between like third and fourth grade, for example? Uh, do you have wait lists? Uh, we are primarily expat students, but we have, a, we have about six to 10% of our local population can come to our school. Many of your schools probably are 100% local. So you might not have that um, same privilege that we have, but we have a long wait list of local students that want to get into our school. So if our school board decides to expand that number, then we can actually uh, bring in more students from that standpoint. So look at what, what the market is in your area. Um, Leah talked about some contracts and, and those kinds of things. Um, There's kind of two ways to approach in, from my experience. And when I went to Bangladesh in 2016, I got there on about July 20th and they had a terrorist attack on July 1st uh, and it killed some expats, you may remember that. But when we got there, Steve Herrera, the superintendent and I, we, ended, we started the year with a $4.7 million deficit. So we had a lot of work that first year to make up and we had to do two ways. One, voluntary resignations um, during these times of pandemics and, and natural disasters and those kinds of things, there are, there will, usually be some teachers and staff that do not want to come back. So if you can give them the opportunity to facilitate that, try to do that if you can. Um, sometimes if, you're, if your school does have the resources, you can offer a voluntary resignation and maybe pay one or two months of salary and one or two months of insurance. That all depends upon what your financial situation is. Um, we did pay in that time, we did pay shipping back. We didn't pay for voluntary resignations because we had 14 teachers that resigned at that time. If you're in this, in the cases right now, if, you're, if your teachers and your faculty are outside your country, perhaps you can avoid paying any more travel costs of bringing them back and then back and forth. Um, we, we actually had, um, we had some packing up and shipping of personal effects that the school uh, monitored and supervised and the teachers did not come back at that time. You also have the involuntary uh, with the force majeure that, uh, uh, that some of the other previous uh, webinar participants shared uh, some information on. If you, if you know you need to lay off employees and, you, and it's already a given, the sooner you can do that, the actually the better because in our case, we have to pay, uh, in, by contract, we have to pay four months salary. So, it's written in our contract. And I know in some countries, you can't even put force majeure in your, in your contracts. So every country is different, but we set ours up thinking that if we're gonna force somebody to lose their job, we wanted to do all we could to help them in their transition period. So we have a four month, but that doesn't mean we couldn't start it in June or July or August uh, sooner if we have to, to make that overlap start sooner and, and uh, actually save a few months salary for the school. Uh, people, I think Leah mentioned about uh, salary reductions. I'm going to show a, um, a spreadsheet that we have in just a minute that we're using. But uh, one of the things that we've already decided um, based on, uh, on our enrollment projection downturn is that we're going to roll over. Our, right now, we're looking at rolling over all of our salaries from our current administrators and teachers to next year. So nobody's going to get a raise, local staff, um, U.S. dollar staff, administrators, everybody. That's scenario one. Scenario two is we're looking at reducing salaries. Um, that's the second step if, if our enrollment drops too, too far. 
And we're also looking at reducing contributions to uh, our retirement program because we pay 10% uh, um, to everybody and we may need to um, temporarily reduce that um, maybe to 5%. Uh, let's see, some positive things and other considerations that might be positive in your particular school situation is that uh, we talked about surpluses. In the end of this school year, we're projecting a little over five, $504,000 surplus. So we've actually had a pretty good year. We're not giving refunds uh, this year. Um, I'm always one that I'm not quick to give refunds. <clears throat> so um, we're going to have that. And we're going to use that as a, uh, as a beginning um, position for next year. We did not consider tuition cuts because in the last two years we reduced, we only had a 1.7 um, tuition increase, percent tuition increase last year. And this coming year is, it's a 2.1. So our tuition increases have been quite low. So our board has decided not to give any uh, tuition reductions at this time. Although we are exploring a little bit that if, if somebody has more than uh, two children in the school, we're exploring that still. Uh, some schools <clears throat> have cash reserves. We're, we're fortunate. I think we all, when we go through the business uh, manual, we always learn that, well, we should have at least a six month operating in a six month cash reserve position. And I would bet that uh, the vast majority of us out there do never actually reach that, that goal. Uh, fortunately for us, we have, um, we have about $11 million, uh, which, is, which is almost uh, a year. It's about three quarters of a year for us and our budget. We have no endowment fund. Um, and so we're, we can use some of our cash reserve position. And you'll see that in the chart in just a minute. Uh, so so could you, um, would you mind showing us the chart? Because I think that would be really helpful. And I see some questions in the chat coming in through sure. the chart. And I think that will be helpful. And then we want to make sure that we've got some time for questions at the end as well, because people have been asking. So if we can see the, your spreadsheet, I think that was really, really helpful. All right, let's go to that. Uh, let me Thank see. you. I'm sorry. To no worries. Let me uh, share that and see if it comes up. Here we go. And let me enlarge it. Can you see it okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this, is, um, this is a chart that we put together, uh, Steve Herrera and I put together in, in DACA to try to help us do some what ifs. And I'm not going to go over the whole chart because you can do, uh, we have option A, option B, option C, that type of thing. And we also have some options showing what, would, what possibly could be um, some employee salary cuts and how much money you could save. So uh, I will post this with ISS and you, you're welcome to use this as a template. I did take out people's names and I changed salary amounts to, uh, to uh, um, protect the innocent, I guess. So, but let me just show you a couple of things on how this, how this works. In our particular school, I think Leah mentioned about maybe using, our, um, uh, one, of the, one of the participants mentioned about using capital reserves or capital or any money you have in your capital fund. So in this column, column A, um, what, we're, what we looked at is we were budgeting 430 paying students. And then we looked at two and a half percent, two and a half percent, two and a half percent reduction. So it goes like 11, 10, 11, 10, that type of thing on the way down until you get to 25% reduction, which is for us would be 108 paying students. All right. And then over here, it will show in, in this column, can you, I, I hope you can see where my cursor is moving across. Um, in this column, you'll see how much we actually lose in our um, enrollment, or excuse me, our tuition. Now, this is, for us, we're fortunate because we have a high new student registration fee. It's actually 15,000 in our school. Um, I, just a real quick side story. Um, it's a pretty high amount in International School of Beijing and a pretty, pretty high amount at the Singapore American School. Uh, all boards and all schools uh, like that are happy to have it. And I might mention that the Assistant Superintendent for Business in all of those schools was me. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons why that part has probably uh, um, expanded in those schools. But they're all thankful to have that. So for in our, in our instance, we have this amount that if we had all 430 students coming in and 100 of them were new, we would generate 1.3 million. And as you go down that column, you'll see the numbers get smaller and smaller because so does the number of uh, students in our school. Now, we had already decided because we are keeping our tuition so low, 
2.1%, uh, that we were going to use part of our capital registration fee, our new student registration fee, in the operating budget anyway. So that's why it says 34% there, and that's the amount that we were going to use. But as you go down, if you go to the yellow column and go down, you'll see that as the student enrollment reduces, um, the need for using more money out of that new student registration capital fees increases. So that's why these numbers go up. All right, so that's basically how that part works for us. <clears throat> Down in this bottom part, you may or may not have this part because in our, in our bylaws, we, you're supposed to pay by, in our policies, you're supposed to pay in US dollars. If you pay in local currency, we charge a surcharge. Um, and I'm not sure if, you're, if it's legal in the countries that you're working in. But uh, let me jump to the next one, the next slide, because this fits some of the things, excuse me, the next worksheet. Uh, this fits some of the things that you uh, are all working on. So again, this, the reductions. And then over here, you can, let me see. Um, you can see right here is, I mentioned uh, a minute ago that we have a, a, a carryover of 504,000. So we're fortunate to start the year with that. And we can actually re, uh, reduce by about, <clears throat> I gotta look like that roll back to see what that is. We can reduce 11 students all the way down to 21 students before we actually start ending up with a deficit position. So, so where else can we um, can draw money from? So right here we have, we have cash reserve and our board has already approved of our 11 million. We can use up to 1.8 million. That's the bottom of, of this column right down here. We can use up to that amount if, if we want to. Uh, here's the new student registration uh, that I just mentioned and how that would be added to uh, that part. Here's our talk exchange. Um, not sure if, that's, if we're actually going to achieve those goals. Now, let me get into salaries and benefits. This blue part is um, our employer-related costs, salaries and benefits. And at this point in time, if we just rolled over everybody at, at the same salary, we'd only save 162000 All right? So it's not a huge... I did savings, but in this particular scenario, using those other funding sources, uh, we are okay. Then uh, the next, the green column is the NERCs, which, I, which is what I call the non-employee related costs, um, my acronym. And uh, there you see that we, we tried not to touch the NERCs at the beginning. Uh, we started with the, little, with, the, with the salary rollover, and then we got into the non-employee related costs. So if you wanna use this worksheet, you can change it around either way you want to. If you want to start with the NERCs and then get into the salaries, uh, it's up to you. Um, and as you get down to this number here, there's 352,000. If you look, I'll, I'll move over here. If you look down here, you see the explanation for what we're cutting. So here's the 352,000, and there are some different things. Teacher and administrator recruiting, conferences and workshops, superintendent entertainment. Well, that's a big one. Uh, marketing PD, admissions PD, uh, that type of thing. Um, uh, just, just some different costs. We tried not to hit the, te uh, the student trips and that kind of thing at the beginning. Those come down here and, and as, as our enrollment continues to drop. You'll see some of those things. So you can take this worksheet and plug in what's meaningful to you. And then you can look um, over to the right-hand side and see, um, what your deficit and excess rate might be. So we're pretty, I, I, we looked at some zero to 50,000. So we're okay all the way down here. And, but if we get down to, all the way down to 25% reduction in, in students, then we would have to use 1.8 million of cash reserve. All right, so that's just a teach, that's just a rollover of salaries. There are also a couple worksheets in here on <clears throat> salaries. And what about reductions? So, so Steve and I have been working with um, some what ifs on if we have if it gets tw more than twenty five percent, what might we do? And you can apply this earlier if, if you want to apply it ten percent. You can do that. But what we had it, what we did in here is this is the administration A to I, and those are uh, fictitious uh, salary numbers, but they're um, just an indication. And so uh, the superintendent said he'd be willing to take a 20% cut, the principal's 10% cut, and the director's 7.5% uh, cut. Um, we haven't agreed with this with everybody yet, 
but uh, Steve and I are working on it from that standpoint. So, for example, if if um, if Steve took a 20% cut and his base salary was 120,000, he would he would say 24,000 and then a little bit in retirement. So you guys can plug yours. I didn't put all of the teachers in. I had to go to a, a down here. You'll see this number right here, 5,598. That links to another worksheet um, that you guys would have to put. Your, you could manually take from your budget and put your number in here, uh, which is what I did in this particular case. I went to my uh, budget worksheets and put that number in. Um, but this one right here, the, the administrator one is a calculated one. Um, then the grade codes, uh, we tried not, uh, we have grade codes from uh, one to 10. Um, the one to five, it probably if you're, if you're working in various schools where your local staff gets paid quite low salaries, we didn't look to cut them at all. Uh, we started in the middle uh, from five to 10 and we looked at some slight reductions. Uh, the way that looks over here is, uh, and those two, th these two worksheets are linked. Um, this top part here is just, as, just administrative salaries. If we reduced by those levels I just indicated to you, then down at the bottom, uh, this one down here, I probably should have flipped them around in the order, but this is the salary reduction for teachers. Uh, so, uh, salary freeze, uh, minus, should, it says plus, but it should say minus 5% uh, salary, and then the gain that we would get from retirement. It'd be, it'd be a, actually, it's a greater savings uh, that we would get. Uh, so that's, that's one area if you did salary reductions. This is the amount that we would save if we did it just a salary rollover, all right? So you can see in the salary rollover, and the, right here, these three numbers, 105, 10,000, and, and then 116,000. That's about how much we would save in teachers rolling over. But if we did salary reductions with the teachers, we would save 336,000. So those are some scenarios that you could use if you want to, to, um, to look at your own, uh, your own case in your own school, and if it might help. All right, I don't know if I can answer questions on that or not. That's great. This is super, super helpful. We really appreciate it. We know that we're really short on time, but we wanted to have, we have had questions coming in in the Q&A. Yeah, do you and Steve want to try to see if we can address a couple of those for people who can hang on to the call or um, how do you want to do that? Um, yeah, I think, um, Steve, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask two questions maybe um, and then we'll close the, uh, the webinar? Uh, sure. For those that want to stay on for a little while longer, we'd be happy to, to hang in there and do this. One of the questions that came up was, is there any difference in the way nonprofit schools versus profit schools would handle or are handling this type of situation? Who you are asking? I'm asking everyone because there's anyway, a lot of knowledge on the screen in front of me. Jump in. We'll offer a couple of thoughts on that front. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Um, and having worked in both um, the not-for-profit and the proprietary or, or for-profit schools, as they're often called, um, my conviction is that really there are very, very few differences in terms of how you manage everything about leading a school. Um, if you are focused on the ultimate goal of the school, the well-being and education of your students, supporting teachers and parents, and in that quest, most of your policies, most of your responses are going to be similar. And I think that it would apply to this as well. The key difference being that the perception of the decisions that you're making will be very, very challenging to manage. And in a, in a proprietary school, every decision you make is often scrutinized from the perspective that, oh, I wonder if this was driven by the profit incentive. Whereas in a trust school, it, it, you tend to face less of that. It's not that you won't be criticized or people won't be unhappy with you. And I think there's, there's an increased level of pressure on schools who have um, the structure, their governance model, it allows for a profit to be taken off either to a private group or to a large um, you know, firm or a chain of schools. It, it, it almost doesn't matter on that front. Um, I think it, it, to the extent that you are able to be transparent, you will help to mitigate some of, those, uh, some of that downside. I, I do think you have to, um, to be as, as open and honest and transparent as possible, and that's really the best you can do to help offset those uh, potential criticisms. Thanks, Glenn. Anybody else want to share anything in that regard? 
you know, one of the things that comes to mind whenever we, we have emergency situations or probably one of the most difficult professional experiences we've ever faced is what do we have in policy? What do we have in teacher contracts? And what does the law in our individual countries say about force majeure and about how we can manage staff? So this is a good time to reflect for future emergencies, uh, what we have uh, documented. And secondly, it's a great reminder as Bill, uh, Bill had said, how much reserves, cash reserves, do we have that are specifically dedicated to a situation like this? So the second question uh, came up was, how do we uh, manage across the, should we use across the board salary reductions as one of our management strategies here? Or should we target salary deductions depending on positions that people have in the organization and their existing salary levels? Let me uh, just see if I can kick this off here while everybody else is thinking. And the idea of um, early years teachers taking a 20% cut and middle school teachers taking a 10% cut, just hugely divisive. I, can't imagine trying to to stand in front of my faculty and suggest that um, the whole idea of we're all in this together let's all look at our own packages and let's see what we can um, be comfortable with that sits much uh, calmer with me I suppose um, the other thing you have to think about of course is reputation um, if you are cutting salaries the word will get out conversely if everybody else cuts salaries and you don't cut salaries. There could be uh, conversations going around our very close-knit community about that. So yeah, just really interesting conversations we're having at the moment in our school, in our community here in Beijing, but also amongst other teachers. Anybody else like to jump in? I'll just add, add a little comment to that too. Um, that's why uh, in our perspective and in our uh, projections that we did feel that uh, the leadership team, the administration should take the lead in these kinds of things and show um, everyone that we do care. So we, we looked at our, at our percentages being slightly higher, but when it gets to the secondary teachers, the middle and the elementary teachers, we felt that it was only fair to, if, if we get to that point, uh, a straight line all the way across that everybody shares an equal, equal amount. Uh, to, to reduce your salaries. Change the topic a little bit. The question about blended learning. Are any of you considering a blended model either uh, now or uh, when reopening the, the physical campus of offering online learning as a choice to parents or as a requirement that a certain percentage of the population is allowed back on campus while others continue with online learning or have you not thought that far ahead just yet? No. Try answer, I'll try to answer a little bit of that if I can from, from what I know um, with, uh, with our director of technology and, and our principals and our teachers and our administrators, uh, we've been looking at trying to develop at least a blended learning uh, approach for the beginning of the school year. Fortunately, uh, I mentioned our, our um, tragic situation back in 2016. Uh, but since then, we have been working, uh, we practice virtual school uh, at least a couple times per semester. So we were, we were well prepared to, to move into the virtual school uh, reality. Uh, although when you do it continuously day after day after day, uh, that takes a little bit of a, a, a different strategy. Uh, so we were ready, for, uh, <clears throat> we were ready for, for that. But blended learning is a whole different thing because of where the students, obviously because of where the students are in time zones. So you would, you'd have to um, deter, determine if you're going to teach in DACA, for example, and then you're going to have lessons available. Are you going to tape them, uh, record them, and, and, let and let students look, uh, look at them at the time zone that works for them? That's kind of what we're talking about at our school. Anybody else on that one? Well, just a, a quick comment on that front, and I, I appreciate that um, what's driving this conversation right now is the crisis management mode, as it should be. But I, I do hope that as we think about how we are changed from this experience, that there will be elements of our crisis management strategies that have proven to be really effective that we want to carry forward. And I, I think in many regards, some level of blended learning that we at times are reluctant to or we think is a good idea, but just haven't gotten around to it. 
um, for whatever reason, we haven't um, leveraged the power of, of the online learning platform, hopefully we will carry those forward because they've proven to be really effective in some dimension of the learning experience for our children. Wonderful. Steve, I think we're going to have to stop it there um, uh, because we have um, a limitation on the amount of time. Yale, you want to bring us to a closure? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, um, we got to the end of the webinar and I want quickly to thank our panelists for their time, efforts and uh, expert advice. Um, and also to thank my colleagues for being a super supportive team. Um, I want to remind all of you that uh, the link to, for this uh, webinar will be sent to participants and, uh, participants and posted on the ISS website and YouTube along with the transcript of the chat and the useful tool that uh, Bill shared with us uh, in, in a couple of hours from now. Uh, we're looking forward to engaging, you with, to, to engaging with you again next week in our second school operations webinar, back to school practice, practices in the new normal, what previous pandemics have taught us. A uh, registration email will be sent to you uh, in a day or so. See you soon and stay safe and healthy and thank you very much.